Eyewitness News, the News Leader, with Diana Williams, Shade Veteran Wah, and Sam Champion for the exclusive AccuWeather forecast. Now, Eyewitness News at 5. We have two reports tonight. N.J. Burkett with a look at how the FBI cracked the case. But first, Jeff Rossett, live in Mount Laurel, with more on the tipster. Jeff? Diana, here's a question for you, and in fact, a question for all of you watching at home. What would you do? You're sitting at work. It's a normal day. Somebody strolls in, and you see something odd. You could do the easy thing. You could just blow it off. Or would you call it in as a tip and face some pretty dangerous and scary men? Tonight's a big decision that probably saved many lives. Started innocent enough 16 months ago. A man walking into this circuit city, asking the clerk to dub his VHS tape onto a DVD. Who knew it was an alleged terrorist who just made a huge mistake, underestimating the clerk, a modestly paid worker who saw the tape. On it, a group of men firing assault weapons, calling for jihad. The clerk did something great. He called the cops and single-handedly averted disaster at Fort Dix. We can't take them enough. We need good citizens to step up to the plate. The faceless hero of the Mount Laurel Circuit City. His identity protected tonight by federal officials for his own safety. He will, though, testify at the trial. What's the message here to everyone else? That everybody should be alert and paying attention because it happens right here on our own soil as well. The guy saw somebody they didn't like. He was smart enough to report it. God bless him because somebody else might not have. In fact, since 9-11, the See Something, Say Something campaign has been a cornerstone for local police. You've probably seen the signs in the city. The idea that you are just as critical as high-level intelligence officials. Former Sergeant Gerard Kane worked counterterrorism for the NYPD. People need to know that when they call in a tip, that it actually goes somewhere. That a detective or an agent actually investigates it and follows up. And in this case, you, know, you see the results, they were, they were fantastic. Today, Circuit City executives confirmed its employee called in the tip, but like the feds, would not give us his name. And it's too bad, because I know some people who want to shake his hand. Oh, thanks a lot. I'm very appreciative. I thank them. I kiss them, I hug them, I say thank God for you. When you consider the bravery here, think about this. This man not only called in the tip to police, that was hard enough to spot this terrorist activity, but now he has to go to court and testify, as we mentioned, and see these men in the courtroom face to face. Frightening for anyone. We can all learn something from the guy here at Circuit City. Live tonight in Mount Laurel, New Jersey. Jeff Rawson, Channel 7, Eyewitness News. You're right about that, Jeff. Thank you. In addition to the tips they're calling authorities, how did the FBI get the evidence it needed to make their arrest? Eyewitness reporter N.J. Berger continues our team coverage with that part of the story. N.J.? There were two informants, Sade, both of them paid by the FBI. Their mission? To infiltrate the group. They were so successful, there are now hours of secret recordings. And the alleged conspirators sounded determined to carry out the attack. Prosecutors say the target was selected more than nine months ago. U.S. soldiers training at Fort Dix. The plan, they say to mow them down with assault rifles. The FBI's first informant spent several months posing as a co-conspirator. Apparently so effectively, he was asked to lead the attack. Prosecutors say he was made to watch Osama bin Laden's diatribes and the suicide videos of the 9-11 hijackers. The second informant did not become involved until later in the case, making a series of secret recordings as the suspects allegedly made plans to buy their weapons on the black market. Former FBI counterterrorism expert George Boris. Well, they're going to give you the, the inner thinkings of the group. What is, what is motivating the group? What does the group intend to do? What do they plan to do? At one point, one of the suspects became suspicious of the first informant. You know one thing that's scary, too? Sirdar Tatar is quoted as asking, I don't know whether you're FBI. But whether you are or not, I'm going to do it, he said. Whether I get locked up, arrested, or taken away, it doesn't matter. Or I die, doesn't matter. I'm doing it in the name of Allah. End quote. Tonight, counterterrorism experts say it's further proof that homegrown terrorists are hiding in plain sight, capable of mayhem with low-tech weapons. It happened in Britain and in Madrid. The shift to a low-grade weapon, firearms, is significant. Bomb in a backpack or mass shootings, I mean... Think of the political message you're sending to a military base shooting, you know, uh, officers and enlisted personnel as they're prepping to go overseas. 
Experts have long been worried about these kinds of attacks in New York City that would be virtually impossible to prevent. What's more, you can monitor virtually every wire transfer in America, and you won't uncover this kind of operation. Sade, Diana. Okay, thank you, NJ. And tonight, we are hearing from the wife of one of the terror suspects, Sadar Tartar. He is a former pizza delivery man who is familiar with Fort Dix. She says her husband is not a terrorist and says he is being targeted because he is Muslim. We're going to hear more from Tartar's wife coming up at 6 o'clock. We'll also take a look at home video of another suspect obtained by Eyewitness News.